Greetings, young lord of Northumbria. Thank you for your video response. I appreciate it. You raised some important questions, and it's my intention in this video to answer them, or to attempt to answer some of them. Also, my compliments to the snazzy haircut. Well, the eternal question of nature versus nurture is just that, the eternal question. I am confident that in this video I can lay to rest uh, some of the claims that in some way nurture, that is culture, uh, is of equal importance or takes precedence over uh, nature, uh, i.e. biology. And let's start by talking about precedence. It is an issue of precedence. Uh, quite simply put, um, we can talk in terms of biology uh, quite far back, and yet we cannot talk about culture in the same terms. What do I mean? Well, uh, approximately, give or take, depending on uh, whom you ask, the uh, 3.5 billion years ago, that's the rough estimate, is when the first microorganisms came into uh, being uh, through presumably some process of uh, abiogenesis. We don't particularly understand how, or scientists don't, but exactly. But anyway, 3.5 million years ago, uh, some, some, some form uh, of life, microorganisms, came into being. Now, at that point in time, we can already begin to speak of biology. Yes, single-celled organisms, despite that, they are biological organisms, hence we can talk about biology. 3.5 billion years. Uh, fast forward to uh, maybe uh, 2.5 billion years, and uh, you know we're we can speak of even more biology. Uh, let's fast forward to maybe 100 million years ago. We have massive dinosaurs, primitive um, mammals, and all sorts of uh, life forms, giant insects, what have you. So, I mean, they're, they're really, we, we can talk about all of these um, epochs, stages, uh, stages of life uh, in the history of the Earth in terms of biology, because that is biology. Mind you, whether we talk about dinosaurs, primitive mammals, uh, giant insects, crustaceans, or single-celled organisms 3.5 billion years ago, uh, we simply cannot, if we're rational, talk about culture. Uh, we can't really talk about culture at all. We can't even t really talk about culture within a period of, say, a million years. Unlikely. What culture is generally understood to be by, say, anthropologists, uh, that that we can begin roughly talking about 40, 50,000 years ago. We see it with burial rituals, the uh, possible inception of human language, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'll get to language in a second, since it's uh, inextricably bound to culture. I mean, most, most anthropologists will define uh, culture within the context of language, or that is, that they sort of can't live without each other, essentially, or they can't exist without each other. But so th we, it's it's quite uh, simply an issue of precedence. Culture is a is a ver uh, on in the <laughs> history of the earth an incredibly incredibly uh, new thing. It is a latecomer, whereas biology has been here for well, <laughs> quite literally billions of years. Um, so th it's quite simply an issue of precedence. Now, given the fact that biology has been with us uh, for far far longer than uh, culture ever has. Uh, that should form the basis of uh, our notions of whether it's an issue of nature versus nurture or biology versus culture. Why? Well, for one thing, um, if biology was the primary driving force in every species, including our ancestors, uh, the various hominids, Homo erectus, Australopithecus, and so on and so forth, if that was the driving force that dictated their behavioral norms, if you will, for millions of years, and the ancestors preceding that, ultimately, are, I mean, our ancestors are those primitive uh, mammals that were living amongst the dinosaurs. And going all the way back then, if, if those uh, creatures, those animals, lacked culture, then the behavior that they practice was a reflection of their drives, instincts, uh, as dictated to them by the bi biology that had been evolving for billions of years and uh, continues to do so. That means that we are running on uh, software. I like to make the distinction between software and hardware. Software that is uh, well, quite dated. <laughs> the uh, biology 
uh, our biology, our physiology, our neurology. That is quite dated and uh, in, compar in comparison to our, the hardware. If we look at hardware, and this is admittedly my interpretation as, as sort of an input, an external input, and we can call culture, for example, that uh, external input, that hardware, we can see that there's no way that culture uh, can take precedence over biology that's been with us for quite literally billions of years. More to the point, um, biology not only takes precedence, but it, it does, it, biology is in some ways the progenitor to culture. Since culture, the most important cultural conventions at least, and the most important cultural conventions are those of uh, DNA propagation, procreation, uh, are merely reflections or uh, in some cases constraints, uh, shapings, uh, different forms of a reaction to our biology. So you speak of different culture, uh, different cultures, cultures differing in the world, and yes they do. But notice that those differences usually are not that as great as you might think. The most important rituals of human life, and we're just animals, uh, procreation, reproduction, that's what culture really is a reflection of. It's about how to sort of work within that system uh, that we have, albeit in a far more allegedly, at least, nuanced and complex way. So look at Victorian England, for example. I mean, of course, marriage, all these things were all very important. It was all about basically fucking and making babies, too. Uh, but you had a whole bunch of social conventions that put constraints on how to go about it. Notice that many traditionalists uh, you do mention that traditionalists somehow favor a biological... I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that entirely. I mean, most traditionalists don't make reference to too much biology. There are some exceptions. But certainly, yeah, they, they look at uh, traditionalism as putting... It is a cultural reaction to our inherent biology and a constraint. So, for example, a traditionalist argument might be that in order to uh, hold in check female hypergamy, we need to have the following constraints on female hypergamy, uh, marriage, and uh, you know the so-called patriarchy, if you will, these kinds of things. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's always, culture is, is, is almost always, in its most important manifestations, a reflection of, uh, of our biology. It's simply a reaction and a product of our biology. And, and it can differ, but the most important ritual is always, almost universally remain the same, marriage, reproduction, basically fucking and making babies and whatever cultural constraints exist within that context. So in the UK, and I've lived in the UK for, I had lived in the UK for over three years, so I'm quite familiar with the baby culture there. Uh, despite some people's recent claims that we, ha we have a, uh, an issue of geriatric mothers, uh, I remember reading an article uh, not but two years ago where, where the young, I think I believe was the youngest grandmother in the world, or at least in, the, in Europe, a 26-year-old uh, mother, uh, sorry, grandmother in the UK. So. Uh, you know, th th cultures vary. In the UK, we have a uh, you know we have a youth culture that likes uh, pop popping up babies, aka the chavs, or uh, the neds if you head up to Scotland. Um, so that does uh, it's going to vary. And if you look at other cultures, they'll be uh, much much more I you know so allegedly conservative. So you're going to get a lot of variation there. Okay, so there's that. But to further cement my argument that uh, the issue of, of precedence and historical precedence uh, specifically is, is important is that I if we, we need to look at um, things in terms of uh, begetting and uh, begotten, so the, the, the agent and the patient, the agent of course is biology and the patient is culture. Um, so let's look at language for example. Language is uh, entirely a biological faculty language, that is, the syntax, the rules, the morphology that hold uh, any given language together. We call this the parameters of the language. That is a biological phenomenon. Um, that is the agent, and the patient is in some ways the culture. Now it's not to say that culture can't have an influence on language, for example. It can have a rather large influence. So you get a large, a uh, great deal of variation in various uh, cultures. Now look at English, for example. This is one example. Culturally speaking, in English, in, we do not have a means of distinguishing uh, hierarchy through uh, what you can only call um, morphological markers. For example, 
you might be familiar with some languages where there's a, in European languages, many European languages, you have a distinction between a formal U and an informal U. You used to have that. We lost that. Presumably lost for cultural reasons. It would take a little bit too long to get into that here, and I'm not going to go into that because it's not that relevant. So in English, we have that. In German and French, you still have that distinction. In a language like Korean, you can literally uh, add a morphological uh, a morphine to every word, adverbs, uh, nouns, verbs, uh, indicating your, your station in reference to the other person's station, or rather, sorry, the other person's station in reference to your station uh, in the hierarchy. And this is clearly a reflection of uh, very strict neo neo -con Confucianistic traditions that have existed for a very, the very least many centuries. Um, however, despite all of that, you can say, well, so there it is, language is culture. No, it's not. Because English, German, and Korean, and French, and every other language for that matter, still needs to adhere to the parameters, the set of rules that, uh, that guide them. I mean, for example, uh, you could have, you can have, we have lots of new cultural innovations in English in terms of uh, lexical items. We have blogging, things that didn't exist 10, 10 or even certainly 20 years ago. But uh, the minute we have a new lexical item in English, it still conforms to uh, rules of English grammar, the parameters. So if we have the verb to blog, uh, the past tense will be blogged. It's not going to be blogasurdede, no, because that neither conforms to English phonology. Uh, nor does it conform to English syntax or morphology, just as an example. So even cultural conventions, say in language, and the same in Korean. Korean, yeah, it has uh, cultural, uh, so it seems to be cultural interference in, in the morphology itself. And yet, whatever that morphology might, uh, whatever that cultural interference might be, it will obey the rules of the morphology and syntax. So Korean, for example, is what we call an SOV language, a subject-object-verb language. The verb will always come at the end regardless, no matter what you do. In English is the opposite, and in German you have a mix. So we, language is entirely a biological faculty, and it, and, it, and it is acquired because of our neurology, because of our biology. Cultural uh, Culture gives input to that, but uh, culture can, and can certainly influence to some degree, but it doesn't change the fact that it's, it's biology, the begetter and the begotten, as it were. Let's look at another example, um, and I, I will get into the issue of women, but I just wanted to cement some of this a bit. So the other example, which I think is very fascinating, is this, uh, w this issue of nature versus nurture in, in regards to upbringing. Now there are numerous examples of uh, siblings brought up in the same house, a year or two apart, identical upbringing, reared the exactly the same way, who are as different as night and day. Even more so, fraternal and mater maternal twins who are as different as night and day despite receiving a nigh-identical, if not identical, upbringing. This, uh, on the surface, and I think when we dig deeper, seems to rather uh, quickly dispel the notion that nurture is nearly as important as nature. Now, what is going on with regards to these siblings? Now. I'll give you a specific concrete yet anecdotal example. Uh, this previous week, uh, we have a new colleague at work, and he's, a bit, he's reasonably young, he's 27, uh, and I got in a conversation with him, and he was chit-chatting, he was telling me uh, he's in the, he was, was in the military, and he's very, leads a very regimented existence, he's very, uh, I guess, strict with himself, and um, very orderly, and he has a brother who's just about two years older, maybe three years older, two and a half years older who is completely different. He's, he discontinued many attempts at education, never received any training, any trade. Uh, the total opposite, although he the brother received an identical uh, rearing or education, if you will, uh, from the parents. How does one explain this? Well, the only way we can explain it is if we actually mo most likely took an MRI, MRI a magnetic, uh, using magnetic resonance imaging, and, and really examined what's going on in these, guy, these guys' brains, what's going on with their neurology. Because ultimately, neurology is responsible for what's going on in, uh, in all of our lives. That explains the difference. More examples. Person A uh, receives uh, a pristine upbringing and uh, uh, um, it was a model student in high school. In an effort to look cool at university, he, fall, he falls afoul of, of smoking. Ten years later, he still can't quit. Ten years later, he's spent literally thousands of quid in an effort 
to quit smoking. He simply cannot. He's addicted. He's tried everything. And person B uh, never even went to college. He had a horrible up upbringing, an emotionally abusive father, uh, a physically abusive mother. Um, he's, he's been smoking since age 15. At 35, he wakes up one day and says, I'm going to quit smoking. And he does, and he never touches a cigarette again for the rest of his life. How do you explain this? Certainly, it has nothing to do with the environment. And certainly, it has nothing to do with, uh, with, with nurture or upbringing. This is clearly a reflection of these individuals' physiology, their neurology in uh, conjunction with their physiology, and their ability to make certain decisions uh, as a reflection of that. Why can some people quit smoking cold turkey and others can't? It's not a reflection of, uh, of the environment, certainly not. Uh, it would be absur absurd to claim that. I was one of those people that one day, I used to be a smoker for a few years, many years ago. I just woke up one day, I said, I'm not going to smoke anymore, and I didn't. And it was really simple. I know other people who struggle with it to this day. Can I account uh, for why? No, I can't. It probably, probably has something to do with my physiology and neurology. Go figure. So these are just various examples, and there are many more, to just show how much precedence biology has over, over culture, or nature versus nurture. Everything we do is within the context of uh, our biology. Now, it's unavoidable that I'm going to have to talk a little about this determinism, fa fatalism issue, which has been, in the past, uh, by some people at least, misunderstood when I spoke of it. Because we are uh, biologically determined in our behavior and our behaviors. Uh, we are biologically determined creatures, animals, as are all animals. Biological determinism, which is, as I just, based on the examples I just used, it would be pretty hard to refute that, that our behavior is not deterministic. Um, if only for, and I don't want to get too much into issues of free will, although it's a bit unavoidable, uh, mind you, no one can account for the inner workings of his or her own neurology. We ultimately don't know why we make the decisions we, uh, we make. We can try to justify it and rationalize it, but we don't know what's firing off in our brain specifically. So yes, we are determined to do certain things. What's not fatalistic about determinism is that our decisions still can hold weight and uh, the choices we make still can be important, uh, provided you have the requisite genetics. So the decision of a person with the I can quit cold turkey smoking genes for a very simplified view of it to say, well, I'm not going to smoke anymore is an important decision. Um, was his behavior, his decision determined by his biology? Yes, it was, because he wouldn't be able to make that decision if, it, if he didn't possess the requisite biology to make the decision in the first place. It was determined. So I just wanted to briefly talk about that. So, we know, we know that uh, biology takes precedence over culture, and uh, culture can at best mitigate that biology or put constraints on it, it cannot eliminate it, and it, culture is the begotten and biology is the begetter. Moving on to women, uh, women, of course, uh, just as men are, are determined by their biology. So the question of whether or not uh, this is sort of brought about by culture, this lack of interest in things worldly, the la lack of inquisitiveness in general, well, um, culture reinforces whatever our own biological inclinations and predilections are. So, of course, in a way, as you can say, well, culture is responsible. But our biology is ultimately responsible, since our, bio our biology is the informer and the uh, culture, whatever that culture might be, that we live in a sort of Western Occidental culture, is the uh, informant. More examples regarding this uh, principle. Let's take several examples of different women. Let's take four different examples of women. Woman A, B, C, and D. Woman A uh, is possessed of brain male wiring oddly, let's use this term that we've been throwing about for a while now. And despite that, she was raised in an environment where she was quote-unquote daddy's princess. She received every possible accommodation she sought uh, to make her existence uh, more comfortable. And 
uh, she le- led, has led, and she's in, say, they're all in their mid-twenties now, a very uh, sort of pleasant and comfortable existence. Now, she has male brain wiring, so let's say she has the capacity to be inquisitive to do things. And despite that, because she's very pretty as well, she has, to borrow some of uh, Girl Writes What's most recent terminology, most recent terminology, um, neotenistic features, heavily pronounced neotenistic features, she can uh, she can get away with basically telling men what to do because men are sort of salivating at the, uh, and frothing at the mouth when they see her. She's that good looking. And so she never sees the need to beca- to develop her alleged male brain wiring because, well, she basically gets everything she wants. Woman B doesn't have male brain wiring, um, but uh, she is equally as beautiful and received the same upbringing and you know, spoiled princess, so on and so forth. Uh, she is just the way she is. Now it gets interesting. Woman C, and B, uh, C and D. Uh, woman C lacks these neotenistic features. She's not very attractive. She might be sporting a mustache even. Who knows? She certainly wasn't a daddy's special princess. In fact, the uh, family is divorced. She was raised by her mother. But she does possess some inkling of uh, what's going on. Um, and maybe she doesn't even have male brain wiring. But she's forced, because of her, well, lack of neo- neotenistic and pretty features, uh, to sort of fend for herself and to understand the world in some capacity. Mind you, she does this in a very uh, <laughs> uh, begrudging way, manner. But she needs to do this. Uh, but she does have some native intelligence, which she allows her to do that. Finally, in the example D, woman D, she looks just like woman C, but doesn't have the intelligence. What's she going to do? Well, she's going to f- probably find the nearest bum and uh, you know, hook up with them and have a shag. Who knows? But she's certainly not going to take um, the same the same cor- course of action as uh, woman C. In all of these cases, all of these women are driven by their uh, biology, their innate genetics. In the first case, the case of woman A, who does have male brain wiring, uh, she uh, takes the easier path. Now, as a rule, I think human beings are much, uh, are just very much not inclined to follow uh, Robert Frost's poetic dictum, the road not taken. The uh, the road or the path that is uh, easier to tread is, well, almost universally taken. If especially if it if it bears uh, greater rewards and produces riper fruit, uh, or even if it's comparable or slightly less. After all, why strain yourself and uh, put yourself through hell if you can get ninety or eighty percent of what you could uh, n- by not doing so? So there needs to be incentive. What I'm trying to get out he- get at here, is with regards to women, and I'll get to men in a second as well, is that even if you do have the requisite genetics. Uh, to act in a manner that does not conform to cultural conventions themselves uh, born of our biological conventions i.e. instincts drives even if you do not even if you have that you that that um, base that genetic component uh, needs to be incentivized people need incentives people don't work to their own uh, detriment usually unless they're insane uh, most people work to their own benefit. They want to see advantages. They want uh, to feel good, to do well. Uh, a woman with a large degree of native intelligence might uh, use that intelligence as opposed to, say, understanding the world and to uh, perfect her manipulation skills with regards to men. So it can be misused as well. So we, we, we basically have uh, the, the biology but the question is, what do we do with it? Even men go in their own way. We who choose to renounce, uh, well, all conventions with regards to women, those men who go their own way also have the right neurology. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, take for example Bob. Bob is a fictive figure. He doesn't exist. Or maybe, no, actually, Bob does exist. I'm just making the name up because there are lots of Bobs. Bob is uh, on his fourth and failing marriage. He's 48 and he still hasn't gotten it. Then take Bill. Bill had about three or four relationships. He's in his early 30s and 
He's gotten it. He gets what's going on, and he's a man going his own way. You see, even to be a man going your own way means that your behavior is determined uh, by our biology. After all, the decision not to interact with females in the romantic uh, sphere is a decision to reject uh, bio biological dictates. What's not fatalistic about it in our case is that we have the ability, for whatever reason, presumably our neurology, to, uh, and of course to see, we are, our behavior is incentivized as well. We see more advantages in freedom and not conforming to those conventions than we do disadvantages, and hence we can do that. Bob can't do that. He doesn't see any uh, advantages in being single and free and not uh, interacting with women on that level, on the romantic level. So the issue of nature versus nurture is maybe an age-old debate, but I think modern science and even careful observation, you, you can be a layperson, has really put uh, a lot of that to rest. We, I mean, it is simply these days a bit foolish to claim that the environment and your upbringing is nearly as important as the genetics that you, mind you, have no control over, that you, that you are born with. Um, it just manifests itself on, in, on so many levels. Uh, from you know how fast you can run, how much muscle mass you can carry, how tall you are, to things that you simply can't account for, um, your preference for certain colors. Uh, if I were to ask you what your favorite color is, you might tell me, and you probably could come up with some answer, but ultimately you don't know. It's some these are the firings off of, of uh, various neurons in your brain. You don't know why. So there's a lot we simply can't account for, and we our behavior and our actions are biologically determined. To claim otherwise is uh, is is really quite foolish. It's um, simply not looking at the facts and the knowledge that we do have. So that, in a nutshell, is my response to your response. Uh, with regards to male freedom uh, versus unfreedom, I believe that too. Ultimately, I, I, I can't cite very many, many concrete examples in this case, it's admittedly speculation on my part, that the desi male desire for unfreedom likely does have something to do with, uh, with some inherent biological quality. And that desire for un unfreedom might be much, uh, much more strongly represented in certain male individuals than, than others. You know, Bob, who's on his fourth uh, marriage uh, on the... Uh, downhill <laughs> on the downhill so um, whereas you Lord of Northumbria or others um, such as myself uh, maybe we value freedom much more so than most men and then you'll have something in between I think most men probably would occupy the mean between those extremes of desire for ultimate freedom versus desire for ultimate slavery or unfreedom uh, but as I said mentally that is speculation on my part um, but conventions, of course, uh, to summarize, yes, are merely reflections of um, biology. Often it's easier to do what is expected of you than, uh, of course, to deal with the consequences of not doing so. Um, certain, lots of men grow up in an environment, even if they do have the requisite genetics, where so much social pressure exists, social pressure that itself, of course, born of our bio biologically determined, uh, instincts and drives that they simply conform because they don't see any other option and by seeing no other option I mean they, they would face defamation and all sorts of nasty things consequences if they if they were to say just say nope I'm not doing this anymore anyway that's this video once again nice snazzy haircut and uh, thank you for your response and uh, yes, I think this is an interesting, um, not so much a debate, it's an interesting topic. I'm personally very interested in the issues of free will, namely that uh, not, only free will, not only is free will an illusion, but it's illusory itself, but that uh, really would expand beyond the bounds of this video, and it doesn't have very much to do with men's rights, so I'm probably not going to talk about that anytime soon. Anyway, thanks for watching, and as always, uh, have a nice day, and take care.